Okay, we'll begin. So we finished our last look of taxation, working our way through Adam Smith's principles or canons of taxation, which were formed part of a chapter in the, the Wealth of Nations published in 1776. So we've worked through the first two and seen some of the conflict that can exist between them. <laughs> Equity having to do with fairness and efficiency having to do with a minimization of distortions, change in decisions or change in behavior. <laughs> so the fairest tax tend to be those that place a heavier burden on those with a greater ability to pay. However, the most efficient tax tends to be the tax that puts, puts the, the same burden on everybody. So the most efficient tax is the least equitable, and the most equitable can be uh, inefficient. So you get a trade-off between the two. So in deciding what sort of tax to introduce, you do get issues like this arising. Are you trying to uh, impose an equal burden on everybody? Are you trying to change? Uh, economic behaviour, change decisions, or are you simply looking to raise a fixed amount of tax revenue? <coughs> the third of Smith's canons of taxation is certainty or ease of administration, which simply means it must be easy to collect. There's no point having a tax where most of the revenue is consumed in collecting the revenue. You want a tax that is easy to collect. So ease of administration requires a consideration be given to compliance costs, collection costs, and enforcements. So how much does it cost the people who are, uh, the tax is imposed on to actually comply with it? How much does it cost your revenue collection uh, administration to go and get the money? And then if there are people trying to evade or avoid the tax, what levels of enforcement are required? If these are excessive, well, it simply doesn't, isn't worth your while collecting the tax. <coughs> so you want to make it as easy as possible. So an effective tax system, when administered appropriately, will be characterised by the lack of scope for widespread tax evasion and tax avoidance. That will, in a sense, become automatic. So in Ireland, we have the revenue commissioners who are primarily involved in the collection of taxes. And they have only a staff of a couple of hundred. I think at the peak, maybe 450, maybe down to 350 now. <coughs> so in the terms of the entire country, that is a pretty small organisation. UCC, which provides education to maybe 16 and a half, 17,000 people, has a staff of over 2,500. Revenue commissioners, whose job it is to collect tax <coughs> from maybe 2.5 million taxpayers, have a staff of only one sixth of that. <coughs> so it does keep the cost quite low. So the issue then, well, is that a sufficient size? Can they actually undertake the collection and enforcement with such uh, a small amount of staff? And we look in more detail at some issues in relation to tax evasion and tax avoidance, what the revenue do, how they use the resources they have to target areas where they feel they'll have the uh, greatest success. So it is a relatively small organisation. Like one issue with the Irish tax system is that it's largely self-assessed. The revenue commissioners don't write to anybody and say, this is how much tax you owe us. You write to the revenue commission and say, this is how much tax I owe you. Here's the cheque, thanks very much. Where the revenue commissioner step in then is audits on these tax returns. <coughs> so a certain proportion of the workforce are in the PAYE sector, pay as you earn. So their tax is automatically deducted by their employer. Their employer tells the revenue how much they paid their employees and passes the tax on to the revenue. For the self-employed, for company directors, <coughs> for those with income other than PAYE, it's self-assessed. You make a tax return and you return it to the revenue commissioners. The tax return can be quite simple. Here's what I earned, here's how much tax I have to pay, here's the cheque. There can be little or no more to it than that. Uh, and some tax returns are, in some countries are amazingly simple. Much the same with VAT. VAT is self-assessed through the companies who have to pay it. So again, the revenue don't go around checking up companies, how much they're selling stuff each month and say, this is how much VAT you owe us. Each, every, every two months, a company makes a VAT return and declares to the revenue how much VAT it's going to pay. The issue then becomes on the sort of the enforcement side. What audits do the revenue carry out? Who do they check? Uh, which uh, areas or sectors <coughs> do they feel that the greatest level of evasion or avoidance would be taking place? But the chance of being uh, undertaken in an audit are very, very small. With a couple of hundred thousand companies, maybe two and a half million taxpayers, uh, how many uh, audits can 350 staff uh, undertake? So the Irish tax system would tend to be um, quite easy to administer, and it does have a relatively large degree of certainty. 
although the tax code is fairly complex, you can work out with a reasonable degree of certainty how much tax you're due to pay. The rates, the levies, the amounts are quite easy to work through, but although there are some issues in terms of what the tax actually applies to, and that's where most of the complications arise uh, in terms of this tax code. And when you look at the revenue collected, I think the revenue suggests that um, somewhere in the region of 1.5% to 1% of the revenue, the tax revenue collected, goes on running the system. So of all the tax that's collected, nearly 99% goes to the exchequer. So there is a small uh, cost of actually collecting it. That does suggest that the tax system is fairly easy to administer. The final, as I mentioned, is certainty. It's figuring out how much tax is to be paid. <coughs> so in lots of cases, the tax paid is done by somebody else. So be it VAT, it's not done by the individual consumer. It's the retailer who works it out. For many in the uh, employment, it's done through PAYE. Their employer tells them how much they have to owe. So certainty is just knowing how much tax is to be paid. And the Irish tax system, although it has its vagaries, is um, understandable in, in the main amount of cases. So there's a large degree of interaction between the four canons of taxation. So equity, efficiency, certainty, and simplicity. <coughs> you can have the most simplest tax, like the current household charge, 100 euro. Put up a website, tell people to register, give us the 100 euro. <coughs> Might be highly efficient, there's no incentive to change behavior. But most of the arguments that oppose the household charge are on equity grounds. It charges the same 100 euro to everybody, regardless of your income, regardless of your wealth, regardless of the size of the house. <coughs> so although we're told it's a stopgap measure, at present it's a very efficient tax. It won't generate much in the way of change in economic behaviour, but it's not a very equitable tax. So much of the focus is given to the trade-off between equity and efficiency. <coughs> Do you want decisions changed? Do you want the, um, I suppose, trade-off between costs and benefits to be clouded by taxes? <coughs> then in general, we use cost-benefit analysis to say whether things should be undertaken or not. And costs generally reflect the factors of production. What does it cost to make a product? Benefits generally measure consumer utility. <coughs> so if in sort of what we consider the perfect or free market, if there are no uh, complications, costs and benefits will align and welfare is maximised. <coughs> Taxes coming in between those two <coughs> can lead to a suboptimal outcome. And this is the inefficiency of taxation. <coughs> when looking at taxes, efficiency and equity, taxes can be proportionally progressive or regressive. And this is simply to do with the percentage of your income that it changes. A proportional tax ta takes the same percentage a progressive tax takes an increasing percentage, and a regressive tax, or so, uh, yes, and a regressive tax takes an increasing percentage from those on lower incomes. <coughs> so it has to do with the burden it places on people in different income categories. So what taxes one or the other is depending on whether it takes from high income the same fraction, a large fraction, or a smaller fraction. So if it takes the same fraction, it's proportional. If it takes a larger fraction, it's progressive. And if it takes a smaller fraction, it's regressive. So this leads to a debate then about the type of tax you're introducing <coughs> and issues with tax changes. The one key tax change in the budget before Christmas was a change in VAT, a change in the standard rate from 21% to 23%. One of the most frequent arguments against the change in a sales tax such as VAT is that it's regressive. It takes a higher proportion of income from those on lower incomes, simply because those on lower incomes spend more of their income. Those on higher incomes may be saving, may be investing, <coughs> or may be uh, spending the money um, outside of the state or other issues where a VAT wouldn't be liable. <coughs> Whereas a person on a lower income probably saving very little, spending virtually all of their money, <coughs> and would be subject to the increase in VAT. <coughs> so if you increase VAT on somebody who spends a smaller portion of their income, it isn't really much of a change. Their tax bill will rise, but only on the amount of money that they spend. Whereas if somebody spends all their money and you increase the tax on that, well, as a proportion of their income, the tax bill will be higher. 
Uh, of course, then there are various counter arguments about why the increase in VAT would not be regressive, because the standard rate doesn't apply to all goods and services, and it particularly doesn't apply to what we might consider necessities. Um, basic foodstuffs, unprocessed foods, milk, bread, <coughs> all would be zero rated. Um, many services would be taxed at 13 and a half percent, so it would be subject to the higher uh, rate of VAT. <coughs> and the argument is that the higher rate of VAT, the 21 percent, tends to be applied to what could be called luxuries. But then the type of goods that are included in that um, bracket might not necessarily be luxuries. So processed foods, <coughs> um, chocolate biscuits, to name but a few, would be at the standard rate. So they'd all now be subject to higher rates of VAT. So if somebody buys a ready-made meal, as opposed to going to the shop and buying um, the meat, the vegetables, etc., <coughs> if they bought the ingredients, they'd be subject to no VAT. If they buy the pre-prepared food, they're now subject to a higher rate of VAT. <coughs> so you can look at studies about the dietary patterns of different individuals to see where the burden of the tax would lie. <coughs> In Ireland, our income tax is progressive. We looked at it last week and saw the rates increasing from those on what we call mid to low incomes, 20, 30, 40,000, paying very low amounts of their income and tax, only up to maybe 5, 6%. Those earning higher incomes, 100, 150, 200,000, where the rate of income tax approaches 30%. So in this instance, the proportion is increasing. It goes from being very low up to 30%. So it is progressive. There are some who argue it's not progressive enough that taking 30% of somebody on 275 grand isn't a sufficient burden to place on them. <coughs> but we do have a tax system that's progressive. It does go from very low rates to very high rates. And the change in the budget before Christmas mean that somebody earning 10,000 or less is now not subject to any form of income tax. So the changes to the universal social charge <coughs> have moved the sort of income that you earn once you start paying tax up to 10,000. <coughs> when it comes to income tax, you'll hear this ongoing debate of average and marginal tax rates. So we've looked at the average tax rate. How much of your total income goes in tax? So for income tax in Ireland, it goes from now 0% up to about 30%, maybe slightly above it. We've set a minimum threshold of 30% for higher earners. You will get a lot of emphasis on what's called the marginal tax rate. And again, the margin ref refers to the next, the extra, or the additional. You don't pay tax at the average rate. If you look at an average, if you look at average height and calculate an average height in this room, it could be likely that nobody in the room is that exact average height. <coughs> People will either be shorter or taller than that. The issue with the margin is what do you pay on the next euro. So if the next person comes into the room, they will change the average height. Well, that person could be anything from 5 foot 6 to 6 foot 6. So the height of that person is what matters. So when looking at the marginal tax rate, it's what you earn or pay on the next euro. So there are those who argue that the marginal tax rates in Ireland are quite high. Our top rate of income tax is 41%. You can get universal social charge of up to 12%. And then PRSI uh, on top of that. And you can hit a marginal rate of tax of close to 56%. <coughs> so for some income earners, each extra euro they earn is taxed at 56%. So the argument is that marginal tax rates influence behaviour that people respond to incentives, and the incentive is the next euro. <coughs> to a certain extent, it is true. People do be behave and respond at the margin. <coughs> but you have to understand, when it comes to tax, how much flexibility do they have? Given people who pay under the PAYE system, and probably paid perhaps a fixed amount every week or every month, they're not necessarily going to change their behavior because of a change in taxation. If the marginal tax rate changes, their behaviour might not necessarily change. They work a 39 hour a week, they're paid a particular amount. Are they going to work less because of the increase in taxation? Well, their employer may not be very ha happy with that. He might say, look, I have you on a contract to do 39 hours a week, I'm paying you 75 grand. It's nothing to do with me as the government to change the tax system. You'll have to continue to work in 39 hours a week. But for those who are self-employed or company directors, there may be issues in relation to marginal taxes. 
because in order to earn more money, they must do more work. So they might say, it's not worth my while to come in on a Saturday morning, not worth my while to stay late on a Thursday evening. They can see extra money being earned, but if 56% of it is going in taxes, they might not simply uh, feel that it's worth their while. So their marginal rates can influence behaviour, but not, might not equally apply to everybody. It depends on the flexibility the person has to respond to it. <coughs> so the vast majority of workers in Ireland would be under the PAY system, and that would have very high paid employees. Like all those there are, and the average pay amongst the self-employed and particularly company directors is higher. There are high rates of pay amongst PAYE. I suppose one area would be uh, amongst the public sector, <coughs> where we get ongoing stories of people earning in excess of 200,000. Like in the public sector, they uh, have a, there's an appreciation of contracts and sticking to terms and conditions. <coughs> if the tax system were going to change, would the, the high earning public sector workers leave their jobs? It's obviously a good thing if we could hire somebody at a lower rate. So there are arguments about the average tax rate, that's total amount of tax divided by total income, and the marginal tax rate, the next euro that you earn. <coughs> the final issue we look through in this introduction is the tax base. What do you tax? So you tax economic activity. So what type of economic activity? Uh, do you tax? Do you tax earning money? Do you tax spending money? Or do you tax having money? So it all has to relate to money, but it relates to it in different fashions. Is it actually getting the money that counts? Is it spending the money that counts? <coughs> or is it having the money that counts? So income and consumption are flow measures. Income per week, income per month, income per year. Same with consumption. While wealth is a stock measure. So you take it at a particular point in time. What is the value of the wealth on the 31st of December? What is the value of the wealth on the 1st of March? Whatever date you pick, you value the wealth at that point in time. Whereas income consumption are flows. <coughs> so income is anything that enhances one's ability to command resources. So can you buy things? So income is simply consumption plus change in net worth. How much money do you spend, and then how much extra money do you earn? <coughs> so consumption takes up some of your income. <coughs> you might actually be able to spend more than what you might consider your earnings. If your net worth changes, you might be able to borrow against your net worth and have expenditure beyond your income. And this was a, a substantial issue in Ireland during the, or the Celtic Tiger Phase 2, the boom years, where consumption soared and was outstripping uh, income increases because most of the money was borrowed. A lot of it was borrowed on the back of equity and housing. So people could go to the bank and say, I have a house worth 200,000. I bought it four or five years ago. My mortgage is 150,000. Will you give me that 50 grand of value that I have, that I own? So these top up or mortgages based on the equity of houses were issued. <coughs> and people were able to increase their consumption above their, what we call earnings. So income is consumption plus change in net worth, not necessarily down to earnings, although we'll consider that to be sort of the baseline. <coughs> you can have an increase in consumption if your net worth changes. <coughs> consumption is the total value of goods and services you consume. So consumption is just income minus savings. Income is how much money you have available to spend, and savings is how much of it you don't spend. So consumption is just income less savings, and wealth is just assets minus liabilities. What assets do you own and what liabilities do you have? And wealth is just the difference between them. So wealth can be a positive or negative number, depending on whether, which is greater, assets or liabilities. If assets are greater, you'll be a positive net worth individual. If liabilities are greater, you'll be a negative net worth individual. <coughs> so although we went through the boom of rising house prices, 04, 05, 06, peaking in around the end of 06, we're now in a situation where many people are in a negative net worth situation. They have mortgage debt of a particular amount, and their assets now have dropped substantially in value. <coughs> so their liabilities would exceed their um, assets. So which do you tax? Do you tax income, consumption, or wealth? So in favor of consumption, it's argued that the standard of living depends not on income, but on how much income is spent. And consumption is the best measure of well-being. 
So if you're looking to impose a cost on people, a utility cost on people, those people who spend more money will still have higher levels of utility. They're enjoying more goods and services. So the more goods and services they purchase, the greater is their well-being. So if you, if you tax consumption, you're taxing utility. In favour of income, it's argued that ability to pay is ability to command resources, and income is the best measure of the capacity to command resources. If you tax consumption, if somebody doesn't spend the money, you can't tax it. If you're only going to tax it once it's spent, and if they save it in other ways, don't spend it, then they're not taxing it. The argument in favour of consumption is that by saving the money, they're not making themselves well off, and most people will spend the money at some stage. But all savings is, in many cases, is delayed consumption, be it pension or other forms of saving. In general, most people don't save to consider for the afterlife. <coughs> and even if they do save to pass on money, <coughs> whoever they give it to will spend it. So you will get the taxes eventually. <coughs> However, in favour of income, <coughs> it's already if you tax the money when it's earned, <coughs> that if you're delaying the taxation, if you're allowing people to avoid taxation, <coughs> you're encouraging a saving, and what you want is actually economic activity. So rather than discouraging consumption, you tax income. But the issue is, so what marginal tax rate is that taxing income may discourage production and work. So in favour of income, it's the ability to command resources. Others then argue that the real power to command resources comes not from a single year income, but from accumulated wealth. So some people could have substantial wealth holdings, but any given year might have actually very little real uh, flow of income. They could own assets that might generate cash flow. So be it in terms of residential property, be it in terms of uh, work in pension funds, be it work in businesses, etc. <coughs> there could be substantial wealth without there being significant income. <coughs> so a person with significant wealth could buy lots of stuff. They could transfer or transform their wealth into goods and services. If you don't tax wealth, you're not taxing their ability to pay. <coughs> so the tax base can vary across all three. In general, in Ireland, most of our taxes are based on the first two. Consumption taxes, VAT, excise duty, income taxes, income corporation tax, dirt tax, etc. <coughs> on earning income. We don't really have a wealth tax per se, um, the household charge is getting towards it, but it's not based on the value of the house. There are suggestions that have a site value tax by 2014, where people will pay a, a sort of residential property tax based on the value of the site that their house sits on. So those in what we call um, poorer areas will have lower site values and will face a lower site value tax. Those with larger sites and in richer areas will have a larger site value and face a higher tax. <coughs> so it will be a certain degree of tax on wealth. <coughs> there have been various suggestions over the ongoing debate about the amount of wealth that's in the Irish economy and perhaps we could use the taxes on wealth to narrow the huge budget deficit we face, but most of them tend to be uh, without much foundation. But if you look at the wealth that's out there, you can generally break wealth down into four or five categories. We'll get to the end of the figure whether it's four. The first category is cash or near cash. <coughs> so lots of people hold money in their pocket, that's wealth, have money in deposit accounts and current accounts. <coughs> A second source of wealth, and we're talking about financial wealth, <coughs> is <coughs> stocks and shares. Owning companies. And in Ireland, most of the wealth here tends to be in what's called unquoted shares. is most of the wealth isn't in the stock market, uh, primarily because the Irish Stock Exchange has collapsed, and people did have substantial wealth in bank shares, and they're now gone to zero. But most of the wealth is what's been called unquoted shares, and that's basically private companies, family businesses, partnerships, etc., companies which aren't quoted in the stock market. There is substantial wealth in those. Third form of wealth is pension savings. So this is 
where people do own stocks and shares and bonds and property and cash, but they don't own it directly. They own it through their pension fund, so somebody else is buying it for them, and they don't have access to it until they retire. Well, if they do take it out, they would face substantial tax bill. A poor type of wealth is life assurance. Which is a bit of a strange one because you don't get it until you die. Or the people who are the beneficiaries of your life assurance don't get it until you die. So we have four forms of wealth. And in Ireland, these sums are just over 300 billion. Between cash and near cash, value in companies, value in pension funds, and life assurance. So these are financial assets. So you get various theories about the distribution of these financial assets. So ongoing issues about the 5% or the 1%, those who hold most of these. But what are you going to tax if somebody sells, tells you there's 300 billion of wealth out there? If they tell you the top 5% of 200 billion of that, so they say a 5% wealth tax will bring in 10 billion. Well, it's true that 5% of 200 billion is indeed 10 billion. What are you going to tax? Are you going to tax cash? Well, that's fairly hard to track down. Are you going to tax bank accounts? I suppose the safes have gone up recently. You'd imagine you'd be able to get away to try to tax that. Are you going to tax the value of companies? So people investing and building their own companies. Are you going to take 5% of the value of someone's company each and every year? Not alone taxing the income they earn from the company, but taxing the wealth or value they've built up in it. Are you going to tax life assurance? And tell you if you can save for uh, providing for maybe covering mortgage debt if you die, covering um, your children if, if they die. But each year you're going to take 5% of the value of your life assurance. Are you going to tax pension funds? Save for your pension, but we want 5% of it each and every year. You better hope you're earning a return above that in order for the fund to rise. <coughs> so when someone says taxing wealth, you must specify exactly what wealth it is you wish to tax. And Ireland, we have taxed some of them. So last May, we introduced the private sector pension levy of 0.6%. So if you want to raise 10 billion, you better go for 5%. But we have a 0.6% private sector pension levy. That brought in just under 500 million. <coughs> but one issue with this is that it was 0.6% on everybody. It wasn't over a certain threshold. Regardless of the size of your pension pot, you paid it. So it wasn't taxes what people might consider high net worth individuals, the 5%ers or the 1%ers. It was a tax on everybody. But it was a tax on wealth. <coughs> there is a tax on life assurance. You pay a levy uh, on the premiums you pay in. So if you want to buy one million euro worth of life insurance, your insurance premium is a certain amount. There's a levy charged on that. So the more life assurance you purchase, the greater that levy will be. So again, it's related to the value of the um, size of the fund. <coughs> so when people argue for wealth taxes, they must be specific about what exactly they intend to tax. So they are financial assets. Clearly then there are what are considered non-financial assets. And these are generally broken down into um, real estate, land, and other assets. So under non-financial assets, you'll have real estate, that's residential and commercial property, land, and other assets. And other assets could anything be from Antiques, jewellery, paintings, race horses, speedboats, yachts, fancy cars, whatever you fancy yourself. You can consider all those to be wealth. <coughs> so are you going to impose a wealth tax on those? So the wealth tax issue is one that uh, creates a bit of a stir. Consider now is the incidence of taxation. The tax code tells us on what a tax is levied. But when it comes down to it, there's only one thing that can pay taxes, and that's people. People pay taxes. 
Cigarettes don't pay tax. A pint of beer doesn't pay tax. A company doesn't pay tax. When you follow it through, a person pays it. That could be the smoker. It could be the drinker. It could be the manufacturer. It could be the worker. It could be the consumer. It could be the owner. But when you trace a tax through, the burden of tax eventually rests on somebody. When taxes are levied, perhaps on economic activity, but you must figure out who bears the cost. So the burden of taxation is ultimately borne by individuals. However, the burden of a tax is not always borne by those initially responsible for paying it. So one group or entity might have to give the tax over to the government, but they're not necessarily the ones that might have to pay it. So when the pension levy was introduced, 0.6% of the value of pension funds on a particular date, it wasn't pension fund providers who paid it. They didn't suddenly look around the country and says, where do we find 500 million to pay this tax to the government that's asking for it? They dipped into the pension funds of the policyholders. Said, we need a certain amount of money. The company doesn't have it. Here's the pension funds. Give it to the government. The government imposes tax on cigarettes. 20, 50, 1 euro increase in the excise duty on cigarettes. <coughs> Tells the retailers to pay it over. Retailers look to the manufacturer. Are you going to pay it over? Tax get passed down the line and the tax is passed on to the consumer. The price rises by the amount of the tax. The minister doesn't stand up and say, I'm charging smokers 50 cent more. He says, I'm increasing the income tax, or sorry, the excise duty on a packet of cigarettes by 50 cent. It then is essentially up to the market to decide where the burden of that tax lies. <coughs> so tax imposition refers to the individual firm or good on which a tax is levied. However, the incidence of taxation, which is a bit more important, refers to the person who actually pays the tax or the ultimate distribution of the tax's burden. <coughs> so directly or indirectly, tax burdens are often shifted to others. So the economic incidence of taxation can be quite different from the statutory or legal incidence. So the legal incidence is who has to give the money to the revenue commissioner. The economic incidence is who bears the cost. So whether the incidence can be passed on depends on the price elasticities of the good being taxed. And in regards to the imposition of the tax, the incidence is the same. So the government could say, look, put the tax on consumers. They might be able to pass it back to producers. Put the tax on producers, they can pass it on to consumers. Or put it on producers, they won't be able to pass it on. In regards of where the tax is imposed, the outcome for the economic incidence will be exactly the same. So you should impose the tax on where it's easiest to collect because the effect of the tax will actually be the same in regards to that. So you could have each individual smoker submit a tax return. How many packets of cigarettes did you smoke during the year? And then ask them for a tax bill. Hugely burdensome, uh, hugely unwieldy, <coughs> not going to change anything. <coughs> if you did that, all that would happen is that the, what we'll call the untaxed or pre-taxed price of cigarettes would fall to about two euro. If the retailer didn't have to hand the money over, the price would fall from about eight euro to two euro. So then the smoker would have to make a tax return and would have to pay six euro over for every packet that they purchase. But they're still paying eight euro or even more, which are now dealing with a far more inefficient system. <coughs> so what influences the outcome? Well, in many instances, it can be quite difficult to work through. <coughs> so apart from specific excise duties, where we generally know what will happen. It is complex and uncertain as to who bears the economic incidence of a tax. One tax we'll focus on as we get through it is the corporation tax. So when a government levies a corporation tax, who pays it? Remember, a corporation is just a legal entity. It's just giving a, a legal identity, but it doesn't necessarily pay the tax. The tax comes through the corporation but the more tax the corporation pays, somebody must suffer. So do shareholders suffer through reduced dividends? Is that where the corporation tax comes from? Do consumers suffer through increased prices? Does the company just pass it on to consumers? Or do workers or employees suffer through decreased remuneration? Does pay fall? So in a corporation tax, it can be one more or all of those. And unlike, say, a 50 cent tax on cigarettes, it can be quite difficult to follow through. Where exactly is the decision made? 
is it mean explicitly? Does a company cut its dividend because its corporation tax bill rose? Would the shareholders be happy with that? Would the shareholders say, why are you cutting us? We own this company. Well, these people down here, they work for us. Why are we giving them the same or more money? Because we're suffering a loss due to tax. Or would the owners say, well, why are you trying to pass the tax on to consumers? The government is trying to impose more costs on us. We'll just pass it on to somebody else. But it can be quite difficult to follow through and track exactly what's happening, where the decision is made and on what basis it's made. Implicitly, informally, it could be a corporation tax issue, but different justifications could be given for the dividend per share, the price changes, <coughs> or pay packets or bonuses are awarded to employees. <coughs> so we'll look at a particular simple example using supply and demand, and one that primarily applies to cigarettes. So we'll use the basic model of supply and demand to give us a look at the burden of taxation. <coughs> so we have our basic price quantity space, so price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. So just to start with us, we'll start with the traditional cross diagram of supply and demand. <coughs> and our equilibrium position will be where the price <coughs> equates quantity supplied with quantity demanded. So we have P star and Q star. So we can use this market outcome to measure welfare quite simply. We have issues, we said that decision in terms of good depends on consumer utility and the cost of production. When the demand curve measures consumer utility, how much are consumers willing to pay for the next unit? And that depends on the benefits they get from it. So the demand curve represents willingness to pay. The supply curve then represents the cost of production. How much does it cost to to supply and produce each additional unit. What factors of production must go into making it? So generally we assume a downward sloping demand curve in the short run, an upward sloping supply curve. If the firm wants to produce more, they have to incur more costs, and these costs can perhaps increase due to over time, increased costs for getting materials, increased costs of funding, etc. <coughs> so we can see that there are consumers willing to pay quite a high price up along here high points in the demand curve for the price consumers are willing to pay is quite high. But the price in the market is P star. So these consumers here are all getting the benefit. The welfare utility they get is up here. The price or cost they face is down here. So the area below the, the demand curve and above the price line is consumer surplus. And then for firms, we can see there would be firms willing to supply at low prices. They would cover their cost of production. Remember, in economics, the cost of production include a normal profit, the value of the next best rate of return you could get. <coughs> so if you sell at these prices here, you are earning a normal profit. If you sell at a price above that, you're earning a surplus. So this area here above the supply curve, below the price line, represents producer surplus. <coughs> so this is the basic setup of supply and demand. And we can use this to analyze the imposition of a tax. This would be considered a free, perfect 
uh, market equilibrium where the only issues are consumers' willingness to pay and the firm's cost of production. And then welfare is just consumer surplus plus producer surplus. CS plus PS is equal to welfare. <coughs> and that is the market outcome. <coughs> so Kenneth Arrow and Gerard Debro, back in the late 1950s, early 1960s, <coughs> proved in hugely complex manner <coughs> that under the assumptions of perfect competition, <coughs> the sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus is maximized. Perfect competition leads to welfare maximization. <coughs> there is no other price quantity combination that can lead to a greater sum of consumer surplus and producer surplus. So you can change it and see what can happen, but you will lead to a, a lower welfare outcome. <coughs> so we look at one particular example. So we're just using one of our simplest tools that he'd have been. introduced to in second year. <coughs> so we look at the demand for cigarettes. Why does the price of cigarettes go up by the full amount of the tax? So again, we're in our price quantity space. Price in the vertical axis, quantity on the uh, horizontal axis. So the issue here is we must consider the type of good we're dealing with. When it comes to cigarettes, particularly for existing smokers, you're dealing with a price inelastic good. Cigarettes is an addictive product. The effect or impact of that addiction in general has been shown to be able to outweigh the impact of price changes. So for cigarettes, we wouldn't just draw any old demand curve and say, well, what type of good are we dealing with? So for cigarettes, we're dealing with an inelastic good. So the demand curve is relatively steep. Maybe exaggerated a bit here, but it, it does reflect what's happening. So the demand curve is very steep. But regardless of the price, the quantity is very close enough to being the same. The price isn't the greatest determinant uh, of quantity. <coughs> we won't assume anything too particular about the supply just go with our typical upward sloping supply curve. So we have our market equilibrium. So we'll just call it P1 and Q1 at point E1. <coughs> so the government then looks at this market and say, look, we must impose a tax on cigarettes they're imposing greater costs on society. Either cost through passive smoking, cost through illnesses, cost on healthcare conditions. <coughs> These extra costs that are being imposed can be reclaimed or recouped somehow. <coughs> for the time being, we ignore it for the fact that they die earlier and claim less in pensions. So we'll try and collect as much off them as we can now. <coughs> so the government is going to impose a tax on cigarettes. So they impose the tax basically on suppliers. They say to suppliers, you must pay over this amount of tax for each unit that you sell. It's like a cost of production. That on top of the labour you must purchase, on top of the raw material, on top of the tobacco, the paper, the boxes, the transport, for each unit you sell, you must pay this cost over to the government. So if it's 50 cents per packet, it's like a 50 cent increase in costs. So what the tax causes is a shift in the supply curve. So the supply curve goes to S plus T. So S reflects the cost of production. S plus T reflects the cost of production plus the tax. How much does the tax cha or change the supply curve? It shifts it up vertically by the amount of the tax. So that gap there is vertical, not perpendicular. Do not draw two 90 degree angles between the lines. The supply curve shifts up by the amount of the tax. It is a vertical shift. <coughs> so with each quantity, for this quantity here, previously the cost of production would have been at this level here. Because of the tax imposed, the cost of production increases by the amount of the tax. So it's a vertical shift, not a perpendicular shift. 
<coughs> again, it's pretty easy to work out the market outcome. We ignore the initial supply curve. That's now gone. We say, well, what is the new market conditions given the second supply curve? Where do they cross? Well, we're here. That's point E2. And we have P2, Q2. The basic theory of supply and demand tells us what happens when you increase the specific tax on an inelastic good. You can see the price rises by virtue of the full amount of the tax, depending on the slope of your demand curve, it may or may, may not be the full amount, but you can see the price rises by the full amount of the tax when there's hardly any impact on quantity demanded. So we see the price increase, and it almost fully reflects the tax increase. So one of our simplest and most straightforward tools can tell us why this happens. So to conclude, I'm going to put the demand curve up. What if the product wasn't? inelastic, but was elastic. So an elastic demand curve responds heavily to changes in price. So put through initial supply curve, look at the initial position, shift the supply curve vertically by the amount of the tax, and compare both equilibria. So believe it or not, for today, we'll take it up there tomorrow.